Ok, yo creo que con eso podemos comenzar con la charla de hoy. Vamos a estar hablando en inglés y en español. Este, so, primero, eh, gracias a todos por entrar. Este, mi nombre es Amanda L. Prieto y yo soy la fundadora y presidenta de Amanda Océano. Y Amanda Océano es una organización sin fines de lucro que pues, tiene como misión fomentar la acción de preservar los ecosistemas marinos de Puerto Rico. Y en el proceso, como dice el nombre, pues nos gusta educar inspirando amor sobre el océano. Entonces, realizamos charlas, talleres y como este, tenemos varios proyectos corriendo de educación y alcance sobre temas en la conservación y pues, protección marina en Puerto Rico. Como saben, nos puedes seguir en las redes sociales, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter y YouTube, que hacemos estas charlas regularmente. So in English, um, we're going to start. Uh, I'm going to present myself briefly. My name is Amanda L. Prieto, and I am the founder and president of Amanda Oceano. Our mission is to promote the action to preserve our marine ecosystems. We are called Amanda Oceano, which is like a play on words in Spanish, meaning to love the ocean, as we like to inspire love for the ocean in everything that we do. So you can follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And we like to have these online lectures regularly, so make sure to follow us for more webinars like this one. Esta charla es en colaboración con el programa de Corales del DRNA. Y hoy tenemos a María Vega y a Ashley en representación. Este, y les doy el, el batón por si quieren eh, representar, perdón, si quieren presentar a, al programa de Corales. Bueno, muchas gracias, Amanda por eh, la introducción y también por la invitación a colaborar con este, este webinar y este taller o este lecture tan importante. Estoy aquí, me dijo, y, y bien como mencionó Amanda, estoy aquí en función del de programa de Corales, como cariñosamente le llamamos. Yo soy la manejadora del programa de conservación y manejo de Corales de Puerto Rico, es el nombre propio. Y somos parte del Departamento de Recursos Naturales y Ambientales. Entonces, se estableció el programa a raíz de la Ley 147 eh, que busca proteger y conservar los arrecifes de coral en Puerto Rico. A través del de programa apoyamos muchos proyectos que tienen que ver de alguna u otra manera con esfuerzos de conservación y de manejo de nuestros arrecifes. Entonces, tenemos una colaboración muy estrecha con el programa de conservación de corales de eh, la NOAA. Y a través de esto, esta relación muy estrecha, establecemos unos acuerdos colaborativos que nos permiten apoyar iniciativas y actividades y proyectos de toda índole. Llevo dos años en esta posición y en esta posición en los últimos dos años He colaborado con proyectos muy bonitos que tienen que ver con restauración de corales, eh, utilizando herbívoros. O sea, hemos colaborado estrechamente con la doctora Stacy Williams, que seguro muchos de ustedes que están en la llamada conocen. Hemos desarrollado protocolos para emergencias de corales. Trabajamos con el programa de monitoreo de corales de Puerto Rico, que se estableció en el 99 y lo hace uno de los más, si no el más viejo del Caribe, el programa de monitoreo más viejo del Caribe. Y aún lo sostenemos, este, así que a mucha honra y orgullo, eso, ese data set es muy, está público para, y accesible para toda persona que quisiera utilizarlo. Y así, eh, como mencioné, apoyamos pues, estos diferentes esfuerzos de conservación. Ahorita estamos trabajando muy enfocadamente en la enfermedad de CTLD y como hemos sabido que vivimos en Puerto Rico, las calores han estado extremadamente calientes. Hemos visto ya eh, la, la data eh, de nuestros océanos, de nuestros arrecifes, diciendo, bueno, que confirmando que las temperaturas han incrementado y estamos pendientes de ver, a ver posibles eventos de blanqueamiento y de todo eso seguro nos va a hablar el LIF en su presentación un poco más en detalle. Así que agradezco la colaboración y no sé cómo voy a decir esto de manera corta en inglés, pero bueno, como Amanda lo dije en inglés, pues voy a hacer un switch también en inglés. Um, good afternoon. I am serving here as the program manager for the Coral Reef Conservation and Management Program in Puerto Rico. We are part of the Department of Natural and Environmental Resources. And we were established by law 147 
um, which is the law that actually mandates the government of Puerto Rico to protect and conserve the reefs on the island. I've been serving in this position for the last two years, and in the last two years, we've been supporting um, different initiatives and projects and activities that have to do directly with conservation efforts. For example, we support um, core restoration efforts, which is major, especially these days. We've been supporting uh, education and outreach activities with our core reef week, which I didn't mention in Spanish, but that's a big um, component of our program. We support emergency response efforts, which is something that actually Amanda had lots to do with that over the last two years because she collaborated and worked for the program um, in, in the last year. And there was a tremendous amount of work that came out of that effort. And so forth, we hold the longest, maybe the longest coral monitoring program in the Caribbean um, since we've been monitoring our reefs around the island since the 1990s. So I'm very proud to be in this position. I'm super happy that we were given the opportunity to collaborate. I said in Spanish, you know, we whoever whoever lives in Puerto Rico and surely in Florida, I'm coming from Florida, so I 100%, I'm 100% confident it's been as hot in Florida as in Puerto Rico. And so we in the program have been paying close attention to coral bleaching, our water temperatures and seeing what else is going to happen over the next couple of months in that realm. Um, and we've been working on a big deal with stony coral tissue loss disease, which um, has overtaken our reef since 2019. And it's been one of our number one focuses in the program is to support mitigation efforts for this disease. And just a couple of hours ago, we held a meeting with our stakeholders and people started to talk about yellow band disease and the interaction between those diseases and what that all means. And that's what the Chrono program is all about. So I'm happy to be here. I'm here with, um, with Ashley Perez, who's the National Coral Reef Management Fellow for Puerto Rico. And we're working very closely um, over the year. For, for developing some of these education and outreach activities and also supporting SETLD mitigation efforts. So I pass it over to Ashley. She can profess herself and a little bit of what she's been doing. And then we'll send it back over to you, Amanda. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, like Maria just mentioned, my name is Ashley Perez. I'm the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Management Fellow. I've been in this position for almost a year now. Um, Maria mentioned some of the tasks that I've been working on in the past year. I've been supporting the coral program in different needs, but specifically I helped to plan um, the coral week this year. Um, and it turned out to be really great with over 50 activities all over the island, celebrating corals with the general public and having a wonderful symposium as well. Um, and I am currently about to launch a citizen science program to um, basically monitor coral reef health. Um, help to answer some questions about coral reef health, specifically after the wave of SCTLD that has impacted the island. Um, so yes, that's everything. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, hello, I'm Amos Santiago. I'm one of the managers in Amando Oceano, and I'll be presenting our lovely speaker, Dr. Liv uh, Williamson. Dr. Williamson is an assistant assistant scientist from the University of Miami's Ross and Steele School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Sciences. As a member of the Coral Reef Futures Lab, she tested she tests intervention strategies to increase the survival and fitness of reef building corals in the face of climate change. And she earned her PhD in marine biology and ecology in 2022. And I think it's also from the University of Miami. Um, yeah, all right. Ahora en español, eh, soy Amos Santiago, soy uno de los manejadores de Amando Oceano y le voy a estar presentando nuestra eh, seminarista hoy. Eh, es la doctora Liv Williamson, 
Ella es científica asistente de la Escuela de Ciencias Marinas, Atmosféricas y de la Tierra en la Universidad de Miami. Como miembro del laboratorio de Coral, Coral Reef Futures, ella prueba estrategias de intervención para mejorar la sobrevivencia y actitud física de los corales duros ante la amenaza del cambio climático. Y ella obtuvo su doctorado en Biología Marina y Ecología en 2022 en la misma universidad. So, without further ado, I'll leave it to you, um, Liv, um, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Amos, for the introduction, and thank you all for having me here. Uh, muchas gracias a Amando Oceano por la oportunidad de hablar con esta comunidad oceánica hoy. Um, thank you so much for to Amando Oceano and also the Puerto Rico Department of Natural Resources for co-sponsoring this uh, talk, and thanks so much for having me here. Um, I am going to not translate the entire talk, so for the sake of uh, you know time, I will um, give my talk in English, so I apologize if um, Spanish is your preferred language, um, but I think that would just be the most uh, efficient way to do things today. All right, can folks see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Um, so I'll be talking to you all today about different ways that we can help our corals um, hopefully survive and thrive under climate change and help them um, cope with this increasing heat stress that we are seeing them experience. And I didn't know how topical uh, this presentation would be when um, Amanda approached me to do this presentation months ago. Um, I, I certainly didn't predict that we would be experiencing this potentially unprecedented heat wave right at the same time that I was going to be giving this this talk. Um, so it is is sort of very, very relevant um, in a way that's unfortunate, but I'm happy to share this information with you today. Um, so as Amo said, I am with the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science. Specifically, I am in the Coral Reef Futures Lab, and we do all kinds of research and restoration work to try to increase the fitness and survival um, of reef building corals uh, here on Florida's coral reef and all around the world so that they can hopefully um, you know, be with us for generations to come and so that we can try to reverse some of the declines that we've seen over recent years. I'm going to start at a really basic level just because I don't know what everyone's background is um, and what their sort of experience with corals are. So I apologize if a lot of this is review to begin for some folks, but I just wanna put us all on the same page of, okay, what is a coral, what is a coral reef? So corals are animals. They're part of the phylum Cnidaria, meaning that they're related to jellyfish and anemones. They're basically a, a squishy little animal with a ring of tentacles and a mouth in the middle. And that individual unit is called a polyp. Then those polyps actually grow together to form colonies. Um, those polyps also have little tiny symbiotic algae, uh, sometimes called zooxanthellae or the annoying long scientific name Symbiodiniaceae. Um, and these live in their tissues and are totally essential for coral survival because they photosynthesize and they use energy from the sun to basically create food for their coral hosts and give that food over to the corals, which allows the corals to survive and grow um, and thrive throughout the tropics. This relationship is just totally key to coral survival, and we'll come back to it later when we're talking about uh, heat stress in corals. So as I said, all of these polyps sort of join together um, to build coral colonies that create this beautiful three-dimensional structure. Here is the Elkhorn coral or Acropora palmata that many of you mentioned in the chat and as we were speaking as your favorite coral. And they are just totally iconic. I mean, if you think of a coral that represents the Caribbean, I think you can look no further than this beautiful uh, Elkhorn coral. And then all of the coral colonies on a uh, reef all grow together to form this giant sort of structure that is a reef. Um, coral reefs can even be seen from space, certainly the one uh, in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, the Mesoamerican Reef, which would be the second largest. These are biogenic structures created by teeny tiny little organisms over time, grabbing calcium and carbonate out of the seawater to build their limestone skeletons and over time creating entire ecosystems. Corals are really ecosystem engineers. Not only are they animals, but they're creating habitat and structure and space for so many other things. So they're just immensely ecologically important. 
Um, and they can be found all over the world throughout the tropics. They kind of have evolved to um, live in this sort of narrow band in the warmest areas of the world. Um, but because of where they live, especially around island nations like Puerto Rico, or not a nation, but territory, Puerto Rico, um, and, and other islands, they are totally essential to the survival of many, many people that live on these islands because of the ecosystem services um, that they provide. That includes all kinds of things. So I mentioned that they're great habitat for lots and lots of marine life. Coral reefs make up less than 1% of the ocean floor, um, but they are responsible for supporting over a quarter of all marine species that we know of. So they're just really, really disproportionately biodiverse, sort of like the rainforests of the sea. Um, and because of that, they also support our fisheries. You know, uh, half a billion people around the world um, actually rely on a lot of the protein, seafood that might come from the ocean. And certainly uh, a lot of that protein is coming from species that are supported by coral reefs. So they're really important for our food intake as human communities, and certainly also the fisheries sort of industries that uh, support a lot of people's livelihoods. Um, in addition, because they create this beautiful three-dimensional structure, they're also really, really important for protecting coastlines from flooding and erosion, because that three-dimensional structure actually breaks wave energy. As waves pass over a coral reef, that friction from all the three-dimensional structure actually dissipates the wave energy and reduces the amount of wave energy that's reaching the beaches, reaching our coastlines, and therefore uh, they help reduce flooding and erosion, which is especially important for us this year um, and every year during hurricane season. Uh, we want these beautiful structurally complex corals off our coasts to help us minimize the amount of damage that we're receiving from those storms. Um, they're also great sources of all kinds of natural resources, including things that we use in pharmaceuticals. Um, of course, places like Puerto Rico or uh, Florida that rely heavily on tourism have their coral reefs to thank for people coming here so that they can fish and dive and, and things like that. Um, and they're just really important for recreation and for cultural value. You know, those of us that live along the coast, I think we see a lot of our identity reflected in our beautiful ocean systems. And so that's something that's hard to put a value on, but um, I think it's safe to say that coral reefs have quite a bit of uh, cultural value as well. But unfortunately, um, we have lost quite a few of um, the, the world's corals over the past few decades. Um, here in Florida, where I am, we've lost more than 80% of our corals over the past few decades. And worldwide, it's estimated that about half of the world's corals have, uh, have been lost. Um, and that has caused this just dramatic drop in not only coral cover, you know, the amount of corals that are actually on a reef, um, but also the genetic diversity of these populations and thus sort of the resilience of these populations. And then we've seen that reflected the consequences of these losses in a sort of subsequent loss of these ecosystem services, that coastline protection, those fisheries, all of that is diminished if we're losing our coral reefs. Unfortunately, there's not just one problem uh, facing our coral reefs. We, these numbers of, of sort of decline are due to many different uh, threats and stressors all over the world. Um, global climate change, I think, is definitely the number one stress uh, and threat to coral reefs around the world because it doesn't matter how much human impact locally you have, uh, you know, you can't escape warming. Um, so ocean warming, of course, we're going to talk about a lot today, but I would argue that that is kind of the primary um, threat to coral reefs worldwide. Ocean acidification also poses a threat um, due to the corals building their skeletons out of calcium carbonate, and if the water is more acidic, uh, they can not do that so easily, and they might actually not be able to build those skeletons at all in the future. Um, as some folks on this call have already mentioned, disease is a huge problem in some areas of the world, especially currently in the Caribbean. I'll touch on that a little bit later, um, but but coral diseases have just become more virulent uh, in recent decades and have really caused huge numbers of, of corals to, to die as well. Um, sedimentation and pollution from various activities along the coast, overfishing that uh, you know, takes the balance out of the ecosystem and, and shifts coral reefs um, towards having more seaweed and more algae that they have to compete with and therefore uh, make it harder for corals to grow. Um, invasive species that also kind of mess with their ecosystem dynamics. Um, and then, of course, physical damage from things like storms, but also even just boat, um, you know, sort of anchors dropping on them, boat traffic, things like that. There's just many, many, unfortunately, many stressors uh, facing our coral reefs. And so we're sort of at a risk of losing them completely if we don't do something about it. So the point is that uh, although there are a myriad of stressors facing coral reefs, um, there are also lots and lots of people working to uh, conserve what we have left and restore what has been lost. 
Um, I want to touch, like I said, specifically on uh, heat stress. So the specific problem that high temperature causes for corals really goes back to that relationship that the coral animal has with those symbiotic algae, those zooxanthellae that live in their tissue and help them survive and grow. Uh, when the temperatures get anomalously hot, get extremely warm uh, beyond what a coral is sort of used to experiencing, the symbiosis that the coral has with these algae actually breaks down because they're no longer able to photosynthesize and give that energy over to the coral effectively. And instead, they start to basically produce toxic compounds that the coral does not like instead. And as a result, the coral actually ejects those algae out of their tissues. This leaves them basically translucent. Um, so that picture on the right is still a live coral. You can still see the tentacles and the polyps and the tissue there. So it's not dead. It's just that it is totally translucent and it is bleached. We call this process of losing um, those symbiotic algae coral bleaching because it leaves them looking white. You can see right through that tissue to the white skeleton beneath. And in this state, the coral is very, very vulnerable because it's lost its primary source of nutrition. The algae are what feed the corals, basically. And so if a coral stays bleached, if the temperatures stay high and the coral cannot recover, um, these, these bleached corals are likely to, to die because they'll basically starve over time. On the good news side, though, um, if the temperatures do go back down, corals can absolutely recover. They can actually reacquire um, algae or symbiotic algae from the water around them or from the few that still remain in their tissues. Those can, those can proliferate. Um, and that coral can actually become healthy again. It can regain its color, it can regain its function, and they can continue to, um, to survive and grow from there. Um, and uh, we are probably about to see a big bleaching event here uh, in Florida, where some of you are in Puerto Rico, and also all throughout the Caribbean and perhaps beyond. Um, unfortunately, we are currently in the midst of what might be an unprecedented heat wave. It's at least unprecedented in how early it's starting in a lot of these areas. You know, we usually um, predict sort of these the highest temperatures of the year. Um, to be seen in the ocean in our region in sort of August or September, but to be seeing these record-breakingly high water temperatures, you know, 32, 33, 34. Uh, one, of the, one of the stations here in Florida measured 36 degrees Celsius the other day, which is just absolutely off the charts high. Um, to see that in early July is just really, really scary. Um, and so projections are basically predicting a greater than 90% probability that we will see severe bleaching um, here in Florida and also in Puerto Rico and beyond uh, over the next few weeks to months. So this is just the outlook for Puerto Rico. Um, in the next few weeks, um, this sort of heat stress will be building most likely in your region. Um, and then within sort of the five to 12 week range, so into the later summer and maybe even early fall, um, you all may experience some, some major bleaching conditions. And then where I am in Florida, it's uh, not any better. I think we're likely to start seeing some serious bleaching probably in the next few weeks. Um, my team is going to be monitoring really closely, um, but I just wanted to share this because this problem is not theoretical. It's very, very real um, and could be sort of happening right before our eyes over the next few weeks. I think we're very likely to see quite a bit of bleaching. You know, I hope that that's not the case. Um, but you know, this is this is happening now. This is not some future climate scenario. This is happening now. Um, and this is our lovely friend, Acropora palmata, the elkhorn coral, um, with a little bit of bleaching, uh, and that's what I kind of expect to see. Um, although I really hope that I don't. All right, so. With all of that doom and gloom, what can we do to actually make these corals more heat tolerant going forward? How can we reverse these awful declines that we've been seeing? And not only with the heat problem, but with all of the different problems that they face, um, because there are many of those. So how do we save coral reefs is basically my, my question um, that I am trying to answer and that many folks are trying to answer. Um, so there's many different ways that you can kind of go about this problem and, and there's no one solution, but the kind of big buckets go into uh, active reef restoration by trying to replace a lot of the corals that have been lost to regain some of that ecosystem function. Um, increasing coral resilience so that the corals that we're placing out into the ocean will not succumb to the same stressors that have caused all of this mortality in the first place. Um, addressing a lot of the local stressors like pollution, overfishing, sedimentation that are causing declines on a local level so that hopefully those stressors can be taken away. But then, of course, the, the big major one um, that is kind of underlying everything is curbing climate change 
so that they're not facing these awful conditions going forward forever into the future. So I just want to talk about the kind of different um, strategies that we use, and they kind of also fall into two different buckets just because of how corals reproduce. Um, they're super interesting because they're colonial animals, they can reproduce through asexual or through sexual reproduction. So asexual reproduction um, involves basically fragmenting off pieces of corals. Each of those fragments, because they're made up of lots of little tiny polyps, um, can actually continue to survive and grow. And we can take advantage of this sort of gardening um, uh, approach, this fragmentation approach to create many, many corals, to propagate them, to grow them quickly, and then to plant them um, to replace a lot of the corals that have been lost. This is really, really effective for growing corals quickly, um, but does not address the problem of needing to create more genetic diversity to make that population actually more uh, resilient from sort of a natural selection standpoint. On the other hand, we have sexual reproduction. Um, so corals do um, produce eggs and sperm. They uh, are able to create offspring that are their own unique genetic individuals, um, but these corals start life really, really small. So it does not do such a good job of creating large corals that are able to sort of replace these large colonies that have been lost, um, but instead kind of addresses the problem of genetic diversity. So both of these strategies are really, really important for sort of a full, holistic, robust reef restoration strategy um, wherever you are. Alrighty, so I just want to show you a few of um, our nursery videos. Um, this is our coral nursery here off the coast of Miami, where we grow thousands and thousands and thousands of corals. Um, these in particular are the staghorn corals, Acropora cervicornis. They just do such a good job um, in our nurseries. Um, growing really quickly, and we have hundreds of different genotypes of them that we regularly propagate and outplant um, to reefs. And let's see. So that involves basically growing them on these trees until they're large enough to break fragments off. We then outplant those fragments to degraded reefs, and they grow really, really quickly in those areas um, and have really helped to restore a lot of the ecosystem function um, here off the coast of Miami. Um, we've also been working on trying to make sure that we have sort of a holistic approach in um, gardening many different species of corals, not just the branching ones, which do a really good job for reef restoration. Um, but we have quite a robust program now of also growing um, star corals and brain corals of all different species, more on these kind of coral tables uh, or on coral trees that have more um, horizontal um, platforms. And those are also being outplanted at a large scale um, here as well, but they do grow more slowly. So they're a little bit more um, slow at kind of recreating that, that reef structure. But we try to include all the different species in our restoration sites. Um, so just to show you an example of how nicely that's worked for us, um, here's a very degraded little reef that we outplanted a few fragments to a few years ago. And then two years later, we have really high survivorship and a much more structurally complex, healthy looking reef system. And uh, I'm sure these have grown even more since then. These pictures are actually rather outdated. But as I mentioned, we don't want to just be putting more corals out onto the reefs that will succumb to the same fates as their predecessors. We don't want to be, you know, churning out lots and lots and lots of corals that are just going to be killed by the next heat wave, uh, you know, or the next disease event. So how do we also address the problem of making corals actually more resilient and making them more able to uh, withstand some of these conditions that we're likely to continue facing? Many, many different ways is the short answer. And I'm just gonna give you a few of those that we're actively working on here in Miami. Um, so first and kind of simplest, if you will, is just managed relocation. So specifically sourcing corals for reef restoration from areas that are just naturally a little bit warmer already. Um, believe it or not, really even just within a few kilometers or a few miles, um, there can be some relatively large temperature differences, or at least relatively large from the perspective of a coral who is pretty used to kind of a, a narrow band of temperatures in its lifetime. So even a, a degree Celsius or two difference in sort of the average uh, maximum monthly mean temperature in an area can actually buy a coral just some natural heat tolerance by having grown up and lived and acclimatized to that area. So we're actively sourcing corals from some of the warmest areas where we find them naturally occurring, especially inshore environments where those temperatures get really warm, and then planting them to places that we expect to warm in the near future, um, and just sort of facilitating that, that migration that will also bring that sort of 
acclimatized uh, slight heat tolerance with it. Um, then there's algal symbiont manipulations. And this is one of my personal favorites because I worked on this for my PhD. Um, so not all zooxanthellae are created equal. There's actually a lot of diversity in the types of zooxanthellae, the types of algae that corals can host. And each of them, although they all sort of perform the same general function of photosynthesizing and giving over energy to the coral, they each do endow their coral with kind of different um, environmental tolerances and different traits. Um, and different corals can actually host various types of algae throughout their lives. Um, they can sort of shuffle around the different types of symbionts that they host. And we've sort of identified by seeing natural bleaching events in the wild and through lots of laboratory experiments that there are certain types of algal symbionts that are just naturally more heat tolerant than others. They're the ones that really stick around in the face of heat waves and actually endow their hosts with higher bleaching thresholds. That is, allows them to withstand more and more and more heat stress and remain relatively healthy relative to corals around them that are hosting other more sensitive types. So um, Duristinium is the genus name of this particular heat tolerant um, type of symbiont that is found in the Caribbean. And we actually are able to um, sort of inoculate corals with this uh, heat tolerant algae in a few different ways. One of those ways is sort of by a process that we kind of call pre-exposure or stress hardening, where in the lab in a controlled setting, we pre-expose corals to a small little dose of heat to just get them starting to shuffle around their algal symbionts that they're already hosting, and then give them a source of duristinium of this heat tolerant algal symbiont. Um, we actually culture them in laboratory cultures um, here in Miami, so we're able to dose the water with basically cultured algae. Um, but you could also just place these corals in the presence of another colony that already hosts steristinium, and they might be able to take it up from there. And we find that these corals are able to sort of shed the algae that they already have, take up duristinium, acquire symbiosis with duristinium, and that actually does raise their ble bleaching threshold by one or even two degrees Celsius, which is quite a bit when we're talking about ocean conditions. Um, and then other ways that we can do this are actually with juvenile corals, which I'll get to in a little bit, but because baby corals are born without their own symbionts, they're actually born aposymbiotic, we call it, they don't have any algae yet. They're a really um, easy way to kind of introduce duristinium to them because they're a blank slate. They're a, just an open canvas and we can give them those cultured algae and they basically suck it right up because they need to be establishing symbiosis anyway. And if that's what we give them, more or less, you know, with a little bit of variation between different species, they will take that up and have that for the beginning of their lives. Um, so I'll come back to that later with the babies, but these algal symbiont manipulations have been really, really effective in at least semi-temporarily giving corals within their lifetime the ability to acclimatize to one or two degrees Celsius higher water temperatures um, than before. Oh, and as I said, uh, this increases their bleaching threshold by one to two degrees Celsius. Alrighty, um, so moving on to a different strategy, we have also employed kind of these large scale um, quick uh, heat stress assays. Um, they're called CBAS or Coral Bleaching Automated Stress System, that's what it stands for, um, to basically put lots and lots of genotypes of corals all at once into various different temperatures, measure how they do at those various different temperatures, and use that to kind of understand um, exactly where their bleaching threshold is and exactly and kind of rank them um, between each other to decide who are the most thermally tolerant and who are the least thermally tolerant. And we can use this information for lots of different things uh, by identifying who are the more thermally tolerant tolerant genotypes of um, various corals that we already have in our nurseries that we're using for large scale restoration, we can prioritize a lot of those more heat tolerant um, genotypes when we're doing our outplanting, or at least make sure that the more heat tolerant uh, genotypes are always represented in various populations that we're outplanting. Of course, we don't want to only outplant just the most heat tolerant genotypes because there's other reasons to have other forms of genetic diversity around. Um, populations with high genetic diversity are always going to be more resilient than those that have just a narrow range. Um, but this has been really effective for helping us really prioritize many of these more heat tolerant genotypes for our um, for our asexual fragmentation and coral gardening approaches. And at the same time, that helps us identify who might be really good parents if we're interested in breeding future generations of corals to be stress tolerant. 
So we have active projects going on right now to use a lot of this information that we've gleaned through these heat stress experiments of parent genotypes and now targeting those um, and breeding them with each other and with more sensitive genotypes to hopefully create offspring um, that have higher heat tolerance as well. So I'm going to get a little more into that, the nitty gritty of that breeding now, just because uh, my specialty really is uh, coral reproduction and spawning and larval rearing and breeding. So I'm really nerdy about all of this and um, I hope you'll enjoy it too. Um, so just a little bit of a background. As I mentioned, corals can reproduce both asexually and sexually. And I just find it fascinating that these animals that are stuck to the seafloor, you know, they're basically living rocks, um, actually start their lives as swimming little tiny larvae out in the open ocean, not attached to the ocean floor yet. So really briefly, corals spawn, they release their eggs and sperm into the water, and they fertilize up there in the water. And then the resulting larva actually swims around, um, sort of like a little tiny bug in the water as part of the plankton for uh, days or even potentially weeks, until they eventually are ready to settle, to choose their permanent place to attach to the seafloor and become a whole new polyp and a whole new colony eventually. Um, so they just have such an interesting life cycle um, that I find totally fascinating. Um, and many of the coral species that we work with here in the Caribbean and certainly for reef restoration um, are actually hermaphrodites. Um, they uh, produce both eggs and sperm in the same polyp and actually package those together when it's time to spawn into a single little gamete bundle um, that looks like, I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, Dippin' Dots ice cream, but to me, these little pink dots look just like strawberry Dippin' Dots ice cream. And that is an image I will just never get out of my head when I think of coral spawning. Um, but yes, when they release their eggs and sperm, they actually release them bundled together as these little gamete bundles. And um, it's a pretty amazing thing to witness that the whole colony and actually the whole reef releases these gamete bundles all at once, totally in synchrony with one another. So here are those gamete bundles being released from an Orbicella fabulata or mountainous star coral, one of my personal favorites. And do they not just look like little strawberry dipping dots? I mean, come on, so cool. And the most amazing thing is that the whole reef does this at once. Um, and so if you're lucky enough to ever dive during a coral spawning event, it really feels like you're in an underwater snow globe. It's really just totally fascinating and cool and amazing. Um, and you just feel like you're in this magical alien world where it's snowing pink dots. And what we do is collect a subset of those gamete bundles that are being released from various colonies. We certainly can't collect all of them, nor would we want to, because we want reproduction to happen naturally out there as well. But we collect um, a little bit of a subset of them in these little jars at the top of these floating nets so that we can do assisted reproduction work with them. Um, alternatively, if you don't have a dive team, many folks do this type of work on land as well. Um, folks are able to have sort of spawning. Um, spawning corals in their land-based facilities and collect coral gametes uh, in their land-based facilities as well to do some of the work that I'll be talking about. Um, so once we collect the gamete bundles, they eventually break apart into their constituent eggs and sperm for fertilization. And we optimize um, the concentration that these gametes are at so that we make sure that fertilization is optimized. Um, and by intervening like we're doing and sort of collecting these, these gametes and mixing them all together, we're able to really make sure that that concentration of sperm and eggs is totally optimized uh, differently than if they were in the ocean and it's sort of haphazardly meeting each other. Who knows if your eggs and sperm will meet those of another uh, coral? And we're able to specifically choose different parents that we will um, put their gamete bundles together for fertilization. I just want to show you what fertilized um, eggs look like. The fertilized ones start to divide uh, as they're becoming embryos, and the unfertilized ones stay sort of round like this and um, don't look uh, like they're dividing at all. And we then clean them and have little embryos to work with. Um, interestingly, we use these fat separators or gravy separators, which are usually, you know, kitchen tools um, to do that. So it's just one example of the ways in which science borrows tools from cooking and from other things that are really not supposed to be scientific instruments um, to do some of our work. So I just find it funny that we use these, these gravy separators to clean coral embryos. So once those embryos continue to develop, they become these swimming little larvae. 
and we rear them in our tanks, uh, whether that's indoor or outdoor, you know, different um, groups do different things and we do a subset of, of those things for different projects. Um, but basically we make sure that they have a, you know, temperature controlled, um, you know, healthy environment to, to grow up in and that helps to maximize their survival. If these larvae were swimming around out in the ocean, the vast, 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 vast majority of them would probably be eaten by something because they're in the plankton and there are so many different animals that eat plankton out in the ocean. So the likelihood of a coral baby actually surviving in the wild is really, really low. And by us um, sort of engaging in these assisted reproduction projects, we're able to really increase the number of these offspring that are able to make it through each subsequent stage um, make them less vulnerable and hopefully have more surviving sort of juveniles um, eventually. So after they have their swimming stage, we settle them onto various things. Um, you can see these little larvae no longer really swimming because they've started to really um, decide what their favorite spot is going to be. And they're sort of sniffing around on the bottom. And once they find the spot that they want to attach, they pretty much stay there and then lay down their skeleton um, and turn into little tiny polyps. So we can give them all kinds of different things to settle on. Um, but often these sort of settlement units that have lots of three-dimensional structure, little crevices where they can settle and hide um, are what we might use. And some groups are able to do this on a really large scale. Um, CCOR International is a group that has developed this really large scale um, way to rear and settle coral larvae called a coral rearing in situ basin or a crib, which I think is just the cutest little acronym for basically a place to raise baby corals. Um, and they can pretty much set these up in the ocean and settle hundreds of thousands of coral larvae all at once. Um, so I've worked with them for many, many years and they're an awesome organization um, that does work all over the world to, to try to um, increase the ability of different groups to use these different technologies and, and, um, and help with coral restoration through sexual reproduction. Uh, once these corals have settled, this is, like I said, a great opportunity to try to do one of these interventions to increase their heat tolerance by specifically introducing them to heat tolerant durastinium algae. So whether that's by giving them a source, uh, sort of an adult colony that has durastinium algae that can shed that algae and give, give that to the coral babies, or whether that's specifically dosing these babies with uh, durastinium that have been cultured, we're able to push their symbiosis in favor of durastinium algae right from the very beginning of their lives. And that's especially important because most coral species spawn during the summer, during the hottest months of the year. We're actually expecting um, elkhorn and staghorn coral spawning in about two weeks time at the beginning of August. Um, and so these corals are going to be born and immediately just experiencing the hottest temperatures of the year. Um, and so there's kind of no time to lose. This is a great opportunity and a great time to give them this more heat tolerant type of algal symbiont because right at the start, they will be facing pretty high temperatures. And even if they eventually shuffle in favor of something else, a different type of algae that's maybe more heat sensitive, at least by priming them with this heat tolerant type of algae for the first few months of their lives, we can help kind of shepherd them through that really, that really hot period and hopefully increase their survival through that period by doing so. And then over time, these recruits grow up. Um, hopefully they're nice and heat tolerant now that they have this uh, durastinium algae that they're inoculated with. And over time, uh, single polyps start to bud off from one another and grow and become their own new colonies on the reefs. Um, I don't know if you all have seen many baby corals, but I just never tire of looking at these adorable little tiny primary polyps. Um, I love their tentacles. They are often very um, neon like the one on the right there um, and just have so much charisma and cuteness and uh, my, my scientific um, instincts kind of melt away when I look at cute baby corals and I just feel very, very motherly towards them. Um, I have many, many baby corals that I adore and these are some of them. And then as they continue to grow, you know, we can outplant them and we do outplant them to the reef. Um, you can outplant them when they're really young or when you've grown them up more on land. Uh, you know, different folks try different things and we're kind of working on trying to optimize when in their life, whether it's a few months or many more months is the right time to outplant, you know, from our land-based rearing systems to the ocean. Um, but for years now in the Caribbean, uh, many groups, including Seacor and others have been really successful at 
spawning corals, growing up those larvae, um, growing up those recruits, and eventually outplanting them to create new, new colonies. And excitingly, a lot of those groups are now actually seeing reproduction in their babies that have grown now large enough to, to become uh, reproductively mature themselves. And every single baby coral that does survive on a reef is super important because it's its own new genetic individual. It's adding brand new genetic diversity to these populations that have just been so devastated by all of these different stressors. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, genetic diversity is just absolutely key to the resilience of any population in nature. Um, so I'm sort of biased towards thinking that the, the reef restoration activities through sexual reproduction are just extra, extra important because every one of those single babies that survives is a new genetic individual that can help its population be more resilient. And our ability to work with coral babies has really increased in the last few years um, because we've developed these um, induced spawning systems, various groups. Um, they were first developed in the UK um, by Jamie Craggs and um, their group over there. But now the Florida Aquarium has been incredibly successful at spawning, I think over a dozen species of corals. Um, pretty much these tanks um, mimic the environmental conditions that cause corals to develop gametes and to spawn. And so this is able to take a lot of the guesswork out of coral spawning for us. You know, if we're going diving for coral spawning uh, events, or even if we do have them in our tanks just naturally, you never know when a colony might not spawn. Um, similarly, if we're going diving, you know, if a hurricane comes through, we can't go diving at all and we might miss that window for the whole year. Um, corals only spawn on a few nights a year, a really, really narrow window um, of time. And if we were to miss that, we would miss the opportunity to have offspring for the whole year to work with. And so these induced spawning systems on land take a lot of that guesswork out, um, are super, super reliable, and might even allow us to have offspring at our disposal for restoration more times a year if you program these tanks differently. Um, for instance, to have the you know, we could, we could sort of create an August full moon condition, but at some other time of year um, so that they think it's August when it's actually December. Um, so that could increase the amount of uh, sort of juveniles that we have to work with for restoration, which is really important. And then other really cool technologies that we're using um, to try to maximize our, our restoration efforts are the um, cryopreservation of coral sperm. So this was developed by a group out of the Smithsonian Institution and the University of Hawaii, um, but is now used by many groups, including us at the University of Miami. Um, basically, we are able to um, collect sperm samples from each of the colonies that spawns. Um, the great news about this is that because so many of the coral species that we work with are hermaphrodites, we're not actually missing half of the population. We can kind of represent the, the genetics of all different corals um, because all of them are producing both eggs and sperm. So by cryopreserving sperm, we're, we're not just getting half the population like it would be if we did humans. Uh, we're getting, you know, we are able to get the whole population because all of these corals do uh, produce both. And we basically um, are able to store these little sperm cells um, at super, super low temperature, but they're still alive, you know, at these really, really low temperatures, um, like negative 196 degrees, I think, uh, liquid nitrogen is all biological and chemical activity just stops. And that includes processes that lead to cell damage and cell death. So it actually keeps these cells alive. And that's really, really important because we can actually thaw this sperm at any point in the future and use it to fertilize fresh eggs. Um, and this just opens the door for so many different kind of avenues with um, selective breeding. For instance, if we uh, cryopreserve sperm samples, we can then take them halfway around the world to um, fertilize eggs that would never ever see that sperm. So we're able to maybe facilitate the creation of a lot more genetic diversity with distant populations um, that would never in nature be able to meet and, and bond with one another and create offspring with one another. We're actually, um, pursuing this avenue at the University of Miami. Um, we're really interested in trying to increase the genetic diversity of our Elkhorn corals here in Florida because we've just lost so much of the genetic diversity. We're currently estimating um, that this species might be locally extirpated within the next decade or so because we have so few genotypes left on our reefs. And so we're really interested in trying to actually import some genetic diversity from Elkhorn coral populations in other countries throughout the Caribbean um, to potentially mix with our Florida 
um, population and therefore have kind of an internationally bred set of offspring because that just creates totally new genetic diversity for our reefs. Um, and I think similarly, that could be really, really useful for the pillar coral, which as we mentioned earlier, are just incredibly rare and, and having really severe declines um, and, and probably other species too. Um, so just to quickly touch on a different topic, I know I've talked mostly about heat tolerance in the context of today's talk, um, but we're also really interested in utilizing all these interventions that I've already spoken about specifically for the purpose of um, increasing SETLD, stony coral tissue loss disease uh, resistance. Why did that go forward? I didn't press it. There we go. Uh, resistance um, in susceptible species. So I've actually been doing lots of studies on trying to see whether um, we can figure out what makes certain corals more or less susceptible to this species, specifically at the juvenile, uh, to this disease, excuse me, specifically at the juvenile stage. Um, so for instance, I'm taking offspring from colonies that have been on Florida's coral reef for many, many years and have actually survived stony coral tissue loss disease for many years. You know, basically those brain corals that are on our reefs now, they're still there, still surviving. Presumably they have some level of resistance to the disease because they have now persisted in the endemic zone for, you know, seven, eight years and not succumbed to the disease where all the colonies around them, you know, died long ago. Um, so there's presumably something about them that is more resistant, maybe genetically, um, to this disease. And then to contrast with that, there are colonies that were actually um, taken off of the reef as a part of a project called the Florida Coral Rescue Project, um, where groups uh, actually removed colonies of susceptible species from the reef and put them into um, sort of zoo and aquarium facilities to serve as living genetic banks um, to hopefully save that biodiversity, that genetic diversity that those colonies have ahead of the disease hitting them um, so that they could be used as broodstock in the future, but so that they would not be lost when the disease hit them. Um, and so those colonies are presumably naive to disease. They've never been exposed to it. Um, and so potentially if they were exposed to it, they would be more susceptible. And I've actually been able to compare offspring populations of those colonies that were rescued that have never seen disease before and are therefore presumably a bit more susceptible versus um, the offspring of those endemic colonies that have survived in the middle of the, the disease zone for years and years um, and do stony coral tissue loss disease exposure tests with those to see whether there's a difference um, in their heat tolerance just based on who their parents are. And my preliminary results from a few different tests have shown that it does seem to um, help a, a coral juvenile to have at least one, if not two parents that have survived in the endemic zone for a long time. Um, so that kind of gives me some evidence that most likely there's a genetic component to stony coral tissue loss disease resistance, and potentially we can take advantage of that and actually breed corals in the future for stony coral tissue loss disease resistance if we utilize some of these parents that we think are more resistant. Um, and so that's sort of an ongoing set of projects that I have, and I'm working on backing that up with actual genetic data as well um, to look at who's related to who um, and what sort of some of those genetic markers might be um, of this disease. So I think a lot of our uh, intervention strategies, like the cryopreservation, like the managed breeding, that can move us towards a goal of more heat tolerance can also move us towards other types of goals um, as far as increasing the, the resilience of coral juveniles. Okay, so I've talked a lot about lots of different strategies that we're deploying here in Florida um, to try to increase coral resilience, including managed relocation, um, trying to move corals from warmer areas to cooler areas that are expected to warm to try to import with them their heat tolerance, microbiome manipulations in both adults and baby corals um, involving algal symbionts. Um, all the methods that I mentioned are also um, really important in tests of trying to manipulate bacterial or prokaryotic microbe um, communities in corals as well. And other groups are working on that because there is maybe a component of heat tolerance that has to do with what other elements of the microbiome that corals are hosting, not just their algal symbionts, but maybe some of the bacteria as well. Um, we're also working on identifying and propagating and gardening 
um, the most heat tolerant genotypes of corals that we can find. But we're also using those same methods to try to identify the corals that grow the fastest, the corals that uh, seem to resist any coral tissue loss disease, et cetera, and really kind of creating a mosaic of corals whose traits we know and uh, utilizing those in a very intentional way in our outplanting strategy, not just outplanting willy nilly, um, but kind of trying to make sure that with every site that we're restoring, we're including some individuals that are heat tolerant, we're including some individuals that are maybe disease resistant, that grow fast, etc. Um, and then finally, kind of bringing all of that together into managed breeding approaches um, to try to increase um, the heat tolerance, maybe disease resistance, et cetera, of future generations of corals um, so that hopefully they don't succumb to the same stressors that have um, caused these problems in the first place. Um, so unfortunately, I'm just going to bring us back down to earth after all of that kind of hopeful and happy um, speak and just remind us that despite all of these really, really promising um, avenues that we've been able to develop um, despite all of these great intervention strategies that are showing a lot of promise. Um, I do think the bottom line is, though, without large scale sort of climate change uh, mitigation, without us really addressing as a as a global community um, our carbon emissions and bringing them down, all of these strategies are really just buying time for coral reefs. And ultimately, if we want to see coral reefs persist long time into the future, you know, for our future generations to also see and enjoy, we really need to address global climate change as sort of the ultimate solution for saving coral reefs. Um, and then finally, I want to think about ways that, you know, anybody who, even if you're not a coral scientist, um, can help coral reefs. So, you know, first of all, just being here and learning about all this is a great start. So thank you for your interest in your time and listening to me um, be nerdy about all of these topics. Um, so, and, and then of course, share what you've learned with your communities, with your friends, with your family, um, so that they also know that coral reefs are important, that they're in danger, and that we need to help them. Um, of course, vote for leaders that will prioritize climate action because curbing climate change is the best thing we can do to help save our coral reefs and improve our ocean health. And the way that we are able to address climate change as a global community is through sort of large scale political action. Um, so voting is really, really important. Um, you can support our research or others um, who do coral restoration work, uh, including the Department of Natural Resources there that does their own wonderful coral restoration work um, by either supporting them monetarily or actually joining them, um, volunteering your time, um, even joining some of the citizen science programs. Um, I think Maria mentioned that they that they have uh, opportunities for outreach and education to maybe bring folks with them. We do the same. Our, our coral restoration program here at UM, uh, Rescue a Reef, includes a whole citizen science component where we bring members of the public out with us diving and snorkeling to do coral restoration. And I just think there's no substitute for hands-on um, activities, hands-on really seeing those corals, planting them yourself, feeling ownership over that conservation activity. So any chance you get to join a coral restoration expedition, I highly recommend it. It's really fun, it's really rewarding, and you get to have corals out there that you've planted. Um, of course, reducing your carbon footprint and your use of single-use plastics is always a really helpful thing to do for, for the ocean. Fishing and boating responsibly, and of course, using reef-safe sunscreen, especially if you're in an area where you know corals might be. So with that, I will finish up. Um, just as a reminder, I'm from the Coral Reef Futures Lab. Um, here's our information. You can find us uh, on all of these different platforms. And I'm more than happy to take any questions that you might have. So thank you again for your time.